You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Creasy's art is dead. He's about to paint his masterpiece. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Well, it's been an action-packed 24 hours, and I had intended of just, you know, just going to make today all about the schedule. We're just going to look at the schedule and kind of peruse it and see how she goes. But I guess you could say we had a tad bit of an interruption. The Packers, after initially bringing in two sort of generic camp body type quarterbacks that we talked about, um, decided that they wanted to get a little bit more of a ready quarterback, not so much of a project or a young guy that we can try to develop or mold or whatever. We want a guy that's ready to go. They went out and got Blake Bortles. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because, I mean, things are Things are wild, and everybody's just really mad right now. And I can tell because I, I, I had brought up a comment about Star Wars in the past, and it was very lighthearted, right? Most people are like, dude, I totally get it. I don't like Star Wars either. And then, um, you know, a handful of people are like, well, you know, it's just one of those things where almost apologizing for the fact that they like it. Like, you know, it's just one of those things. I grew up with it. You know how it is. So, yeah, I mean, I get what you're saying, but, you know, whatever. Just instant vitriol. Like, people are so just sensitive right now. Sensitive is the perfect word. You know how when you get sunburn, it doesn't take much. If somebody touches very gently on your skin when you have sunburn, you react very um, outwardly, right? You jerk your arm away. You yell like, dude, why are you touching me? You don't see I'm sunburned? It hurts so bad. Now, under normal conditions, that's irrational. I remember um, when uh, my half Mexican lawyer and I went to South Carolina just on a whim on a weekend, like, dude, let's just drive to South Carolina. So that's what we did. But um, two Wisconsin boys out in the sun, uh, you know, by the ocean all day, got pretty burnt up pretty good. And so the next day, we're supposed to drive all the way back to Wisconsin from South Carolina and um, completely sunburned. And that that, uh, seatbelt, really uncomfortable. Normally, a seatbelt, although not the best thing in the world, it's kind of kind of just indifferent. Normally, it's not a big deal. On that day, it was a real big deal. I had to pull the car over and be like, all right, let's 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 uh, let's get this aloe going here. Let's get it slathered up because I can't wear this seatbelt. Sensitive is exactly what people are. The littlest thing just sets them into a rage. And again, a joke, and it's, it's sort of like a, a little bit of a test case. I pulled an old joke out and just threw it on Twitter to see what would happen. Instantly angry reactions everywhere. People are just so mad right now. And so... I can't even have normal levels of analysis because people will go into an absolute rage. Just very basic things. Hey, the Packers generally don't go out and get veteran-type quarterbacks. This guy's ready to go, ready to play immediately. That's a little unusual. I wonder if there's something to that. Oh, yeah, that's right. We have a, a quarterback that has not taken a single snap in Jordan Love, like anywhere, and another quarterback that says he's going to leave. <laughs> I mean, this it's I don't think it's too crazy to say that there's a little bit of a correlation there, but no, you can't oh my how dare you? How dare you be so stupid as to think that a quarterback with no experience and another quarterback literally saying he wants out has something to do with Blake Bortles being here. How, just outrageous. Outrageous. I mean, it's just It's a little crazy out there right now. So look, let's just summarize it this way. Obviously, I tend to think this is out of the norm because it is. And I have people on Twitter telling me, no, they do this stuff all the time. Do they? Okay, rule out 2013 and tell me one time when this has happened. Or the other thing they'll say is, well, other teams do this all the time, like the Broncos. Right, the Broncos don't even have a starter. The Packers supposedly, at least according to people who are very mad, have a Hall of Fame quarterback and a number one overall quarterback as a backup. They should be set. If it's not about either Jordan Love or Aaron Rodgers, then that's what we're assuming, right? 
If this is just a normal thing, then this is a normal thing based on our situation, not just in general. It's outside of the norm for the Packers in particular, especially now. Except it's not especially now, because especially now, Rodgers wants out and Jordan Love has no experience. Now, with all that said, do I know 100% that that's what this is about? No, I don't. Is it rational to at least assume that maybe that could have something to do with it? I think that's I think that's okay. Is it also okay to say that I don't think it has anything to do with it? Yes, but based on the massive outrage, again, I just think that there are... Again, there, there is a contingent of people who are very mad at the media, who believe that a lot of this is fake, that everything's fine, and there's like a 2% chance that Rodgers leaves, if that. Those people are very, very angry and sensitive about, about a lot of things. And having adult conversations about the fact that we are in a reality in which Aaron Rodgers has told the team he doesn't want to be here, we can't talk about it. And people are mad that we're talking about it. How dare you talk? What else is there to talk about? It's the biggest bit of Packers news since I've been doing the podcast, maybe, that Aaron Rodgers has said he doesn't want to be with this team anymore. So yeah, I'm going to talk about it. And we're going to have grown-up adult conversations about what is the role of Jordan Love? What is now the role of Blake Bortles? Why, instead of bringing in what the Packers always bring in, very young, very underdeveloped camp arms to simply throw footballs and run um, scout team, why does Blake Bortles need to run scout team? He doesn't. Of course he doesn't. Now, does it kill anything? No. But it's just completely unnecessary. And everybody acts like, oh, well, I mean, come on, it makes total sense because he's got, uh, he understands the system. Then why do we never do this? Why isn't this common practice? Why isn't it just veterans all the time? Why wasn't Blake Bortles here last year? Come on now. At least allow people the ability to ask the question or at least have the position that I think that this has something to do with something. But no, we can't, you can't have that opinion. You're not allowed to have that opinion. Come on, grow up. It's like I said on Twitter, you can overreact in two different ways. And, and, and the, again, the pro Rogers contingent, I'm calling them, are massively overreacting. And the number one thing that they love to say is that everybody's overreacting. No, you're overreacting. We're just positing. I'm saying possibly, interesting, that's weird, that doesn't usually happen. I wonder if it has to do with this exact situation that we are in. Would kind of make sense. It's, there's nothing wrong with just, just asking it. But man, people are all wound up. So let's put it this way. If Brian Gutekunst and Matt LaFleur allowed you to be in their meeting rooms, and, and I'm in there too, okay? So you're in there, and I'm in there, and they're sitting us down, and they're like, hey, look, um... We were thinking for our number three this year, we wanted to kind of mix it up. We want to bring in a veteran, Blake Bortles, super cheap. He's got a ton of experience. Maybe he can kind of help Jordan along. You know, he's, he's going to be the number three, but, you know, he can be kind of a little bit of more of a mentor, even though that's what Rodgers is here for, but we'll just skirt that little issue. And um, it's just, you know, it's just something. You know, we need somebody in here to throw footballs, and we'll see what he can do. Would, would that just, like, defy reality? No. Be like, all right, cool. Is it possible that that's as far as they got into this process? Sure, maybe that's all it was. Like, dude, Blake's out there. Hey, didn't you uh, didn't you coach Blake? Yeah, dude. So some of the stuff we do here, he's familiar with. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You think we should just bring him in? Just you know, oh yeah, sure, whatever. Maybe that's all it was. I don't know. But let me put it this way: What if they said we don't really know about Jordan Love? We're not sure if he's ready. And so if Rodgers goes down, we need somebody to be ready. And so we're getting a different style of quarterback, a guy that's going to be ready, not good, but ready to play, understands the playbook, understands how NFL teams work, you know, just because he's been a starter, been around, intelligent, knows things, you know. So we're going to bring in Blake instead of Chad Kelly, who we talked about. Would that just blow everybody's brain off? I just made up terms. Don't worry about it. I mean, it, would would reality just shatter? Would the fabric of space-time tear right down? Does it even have a middle? I don't know. But would it tear down the middle because it just it's it's just impossible? I don't think so. I think that's possible that that was the discussion that they had. Is it possible that they said, we're not making very good progress with this Aaron Rodgers thing. Maybe we should bring in Blake just in case it doesn't work out? Is that 100,000% impossible so that you're going to go out and just have an absolute rage fit on Twitter if anybody even thinks those thoughts? 
Is it rational to be so angry at, at the possibility that maybe that conversation can't? I mean, would you lunge across the table at Gudekunst and start choking him? How could you be so stupid? Your negotiations are going great. He loves it here. I mean, I'm just wondering what would happen if that conversation came up. I, I just, I th again, I don't think any of these possibilities are that earth shattering. So maybe it means nothing. Maybe it means something. It is unusual. And, and for all the people that uh, have been telling me, no, they do this all the time, um, just because you all annoyed me so much, I'm prepared to go through every single year and look at our number three quarterbacks to find out how many seasoned veterans there are if you want to play that game. Year after year after year after year of Packer fans saying, please bring in a veteran. Please bring in a guy like Nick Foles. Please bring in somebody that can be a veteran backup so that we have a chance when Aaron Rodgers... Do you know how every year we have that conversation? Every single freaking year. If Aaron Rodgers goes down, we're done, and that's stupid. Why are you guys doing that? You should bring in a veteran so that we at least have a chance. The Eagles won a Super Bowl with their backup. Couldn't hurt to just bring in a guy. But the Packers never do it, and that's a source of frustration. This year, they did it. And everyone's like, oh, we do that all the time. It's no big deal. So what? <laughs> okay. Okay. Whatever. I guess we can't have this conversation. So I guess what we'll do instead is look at the schedule with Aaron Rodgers, because it has to be Aaron Rodgers. We have to only assume Aaron Rodgers. Well, now I'm getting Star Wars updates all the time. Anyways, before we get to the schedule, though, I forgot. Um, I do have some good news. Apparently, Brian Gutekunst did reach out to Aaron Rodgers about this signing, and we were able to uh, intercept that voicemail, so I want to play that for you, and then we'll uh, move on with the schedule. Hey, Rodgers, you big boy, Goot. Uh, I was just reaching out to let you know, uh, look, I know we offered you the biggest contract ever. I said I'd, I'd consult you with everything. We we talked about how we're going to talk. Um just want to let you know, I got drunk. I was watching The Good Place. Uh, Blake Portals was available. He came into town. He talked to Mark Murphy. Murphy was like, hey, you should sign up. And I, I signed the paperwork. I forgot to tell you, don't be mad. I hope this doesn't blow everything up. He's probably going to be on the practice squad level, probably not even be on the team anyway because, you know, that's what you want. I, I just I, – I forgot to let you know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> In all seriousness, no. How weird is is this situation with uh, Blake Bortles and Aaron? Rod because again, we're assuming Aaron Rodgers is sticking around, and even if he's not, the Packers are assuming that he's going to, or at least they're trying to move forward as though they um, are going to. Right. So I have to assume they did call Aaron Rodgers about Blake Bortles, right? I mean, he, they had to, because I can't imagine he's that mad about Jordan Love. And then we sign Blake Bortles and don't tell him, well, this isn't his replacement. Yeah, but Rodgers doesn't know that. How does Rodgers know that this isn't them moving to push him out the door? If I'm good at cunts, you can't risk that. I'm not, I'm not trying to play mind reader. I'm just trying to keep Aaron Rodgers in the loop on stuff. But then how awkward is that? Because it almost feels condescending, you know? Like, hey, man, just letting you know uh, we're thinking about signing Blake Bortles. I don't know how you feel about that. Like, dude, why are you being a jerk? Like, I don't care if you sign Blake Bortles. That's not the point. Like, you, you're being a condescending... You know what I mean? Like, what do you... You, you can't win. That's a no-win situation. If you don't call, you just did it again. If you do call, that's super condescending. And then what do you say? Like, did do you ask his permission? Or are you just giving him a heads up? Which would probably make the most sense. Like, hey, man, I just want to let you know uh, we're bringing in Blake Bortles. He's got a lot of experience with our offensive coordinator. Um, obviously got nothing to do with your job. You know, I, I probably wouldn't even bring that up. I don't, I don't know. I, it's just, it's such a weird and uncomfortable thing. It's like, it's like if I were to go out and get like a big old steak with the boys at lunch at work and it costs like $59 and my wife finds it and is like, what is this? It's like, oh yeah, I went, I went out for steaks with the boys, you know, and it turns into a big argument. And at the end of it, she's like, listen, you, you just, you can't be spending money without talking to me first. And so then the next day at work, I call her and ask if I can get like a, a 99 cent candy bar from the vending machine. You know, it's, I, what am I supposed to do? Like if I spend money again and I don't tell her, then it's like, why are you doing this? Why are you not talking? But if I do, it's like, you're being an idiot. Like, so, so what, you think I'm being overbearing? Is that what you're saying? Like, no, I'm just trying to follow the rules. I, I don't know what to do. Is it just me or I, I don't know. 
I think about these things. Not the steak, I mean the Blake Bortles thing. We're back to Bortles now. I don't know. That That's part of my issue with this whole situation is, again, you can't fix it entirely. I think the best case scenario is we just got to move on. And sometimes, I mean, getting back to the marriage thing, that's just the best way to move forward. So many of the earlier arguments is just not having a path to moving forward. Neither of us knew, like, we're both really mad. We're obviously not seeing eye to eye, so we can't resolve this, right? She sees one thing, I see another thing. And I'm not going to just, like, back down and be like, no, you're right, even though I know she's wrong. And she's not going to say, I know you're right, because she knows I'm wrong. We didn't have, like, mechanisms in place to just drop it and move forward. And it's just squashed. It's done, right? Whatever that may be. You develop these things over time. Go to Cunts and Rogers need to develop that kind of a system. Something where it's like, you know, we had a fight and it's uncomfortable and the phone calls are weird and awkward and, and we kind of laid it all out on the table. We said some stuff we don't exactly feel good about, did some things we don't exactly feel good about, but you know what? We got to just find a way to just move on. Like, I'm just going to go back and do the GM thing and you're going to go back and do the, the quarterback thing. And um, we're just we're just going to get over what happened here, which is not going to be easy because there's a lot of stuff that just happened. But whatever. Again, I'm still sitting at like the 65 percent chance Rodgers comes back, I think is kind of about what I said yesterday. And I, I still feel about that. It might even be taken upward a little bit. I don't know. Just the more this goes on, it just feels like, you know, where's he going to go? What, what's he going to do? I know he's super stubborn and I know he's going to get dug in. Maybe he really does just pull the trigger and is like, I, I, I'm just going to retire or he for, I don't know. But if I had to put my money somewhere, it would be Rodgers and the Packers. Of you know, the, the news is going to break. They've come to some agreement and then they're going to go in front of the media and be like, this was never that big of a deal. You guys blew it out of proportion. And Rodgers is going to go in front of the media and say, this was no big deal. You blew it out of proportion. Although obviously this is a big deal because he told the team he's not coming back next year, but that's how they'll play it down. They'll just pin it on the media. And, you know, sometimes that's the best way to move forward in a fight, too, is you find a scapegoat. You know, you both know that they don't really deserve it, but you just pin it on them. You know, the kids, the dog, I don't know, the neighbor. I'm sorry I'm snippy. It's just the the neighbor Frank is just, he's bugging me about the lawn again, you know. It's like, oh, I hate Frank. I know, right? Oh, he's the worst. He's such a jerk. Frank's a good guy, but you know what? If this is going to save my marriage, we both hate Frank now. It's just, sorry, Frank, you got to take one for the team. And so if that's what it takes for them to just come out and be like, yeah, there was never anything here. The media lied. Just do it. I don't care. Just a thought. I'm just saying things at this point. I don't know. A lot of marriage now. Everybody's going to think, oh, man, he's he's having a rough time with his marriage. (laughs) I'm actually upset I don't have food analogies. I made some really upscale food today. I'm proud of it. Blake Bortles said, pack it up, pack it in, let Bortles begin. I come to win. Battle me. That's a sin. I won't ever slack up. Punk, you better back up. I'm invincible. I literally accidentally just clicked on this, and that's what it says. And this is... Oh, it's not the real Blake Bortles. That's good. That's nice. I just, I just clicked on something, and I'm like, what is Blake saying now? Anyways, so I decided I'm going to make, like, upscale food myself, because why pay for it if you can just make it yourself? First attempt, made some stuffed shells. I'm not going to lie, man. Homemade pasta sauce. I don't know, like, the specific name for it, if it's, like, a stuffed shell sauce or if it's just a spaghetti sauce. I don't know. I'm just learning this stuff as I go. Flipping amazing. The shells themselves, I don't know. They were fine. But that sauce, like, I could drink it with a straw. It's amazing. And I got pizza dough sitting in the fridge overnight. I'm gonna try that tomorrow. So I'm feeling good about life. I wish I could have come up with some kind of an analogy so that there was a more natural way for me to explain those things to you. But it didn't come up, so I'm just gonna brag, um without anybody asking or wanting to know. So anyways, why don't we just take a break? Um, It's a decent time and I would like to go to bed early. Although every time I say it's going to be short, it ends up going long. So I'm just going to say this is going to be a long episode, but let's take a break. Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can join up for as little as a dollar a month. And for just a dollar, which is $12 a year, actually, if you sign up for the year, it's like 10 bucks. You get access to the podcast episodes early and ad free. Little, little perk for you. But anyways, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. 
Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. So I had a lot of fun today tracking this and trying to like keep up with all the latest stuff. And then, you know, eventually somebody else just has their own tracker. And then, of course, you know, by the end of the night, the full schedule's out and you feel like, why did I waste my time doing this? But it's fun. It's fun in the moment to like, I'm, I'm, I'm getting all the info, man. I'm compiling it. You guys want to see? And of course, nobody does, but it's fun. I have fun. But uh, the full schedule's out, including the preseason, which freaks me out because it's three weeks. And of course, we have week 18 on the schedule. So there's a lot of weird stuff here. Um, but I actually want to start with preseason because that's, as much as anybody might not care, I massively care. And I mentioned this before. I want to see these guys. Now, I mean, just think about this. There almost isn't any anybody out on the field that I don't want to see. You know, usually you never see anybody that you care about, right? You want to see Aaron Rodgers, and you want to see the first team, and that's it. And they almost never play. Now it's like, dude, our running backs, first of all, our quarterbacks. We have three first-round quarterbacks on the roster right now. Aaron Rodgers, Jordan Love, and Blake Bortles. And I would love to see all three of them. Really want to see Jordan Love. Wouldn't mind seeing Blake Bortles tear it up, just because why not? I like watching the Packers be awesome. And he's going to get the opportunity to go up against twos and threes. And like, that's the whole preseason. is Just a big fat. Yes, please. Running backs. I like all of them. Little dash of Aaron Jones here. Hefty dose of A.J. Dillon. Probably more than we saw him in the regular season. We got Dexter Williams, who I feel like all of us really like. I don't know why, but we like him. And I'm just, I'm excited about him. He seems super fast and strong and... I just like him. We drafted Kylan Hill. Definitely want to see the guy. Patrick Taylor. Why not? Don't care. Let's do it. The wide receivers. Of course, you want to see Devontae. You want to see Lazard. But, I mean, you've also got Equinemius. I like Equinemius. I like Malik Taylor. But there's also Devin Funchess. And there's Amari Rogers. So, like, even the depth is what I'm saying is is awesome. We're not going to see Bakhtiari, obviously. But you get to see a heavier dose of John Runyon, which we don't usually get to see. We're going to see a heavy dose of Royce Newman. We're going to see a heavy dose of Simon Stepniak that we didn't see last year, which is exciting. We're going to see a heavy dose of Josh Myers. We got the two Badger boys, Cole Van Lannan and John Dietzen. We got Jake Hansen at center that we didn't really get a chance to see that we're going to see. I'm excited about all these guys. I generally could not care any less about anybody but starters, especially along the offensive line. These are all young, promising guys that we have hardly seen at all. John Runyon, Royce Newman, Simon Stepniak, Josh Myers, Cole Van Lannan, Jake Hansen, John Dietzen. That's like 70% of our offensive line are young guys that we want to get a chance to watch and, and appreciate. Tight ends. A lot of people think this is Jace's year to break out. Be fun to watch him. Obviously, Mercedes gets a little bit. Tunyon you get to see a little bit. Josiah DeGuara is a guy that I'm super excited about, as you know. Dominique Daphne had some flashes. I mean, he's a fun guy to watch. Defensively, we got Tadaryl Slayton. TJ Slayton, we get a chance to watch, as well as Kingsley Kiki, not a starter, so maybe get a little bit more time with him. Probably won't see, I don't know about the edge rushers. I would assume maybe we get a little heavy dose of Rashawn Gary. Maybe not, I don't know. I do like uh, typical Leia. But then linebacker, I mean, there's so many guys that were kind of pushed down, you know, because we had our number one, and he played most of the time. We did see a slightly heavy dose of Chris Barnes, but not too much. I think we're going to see a heavy dose of Chris Barnes because he's probably the Packers' number one linebacker right now. There's also Kamal Kamal Martin, who I like a lot. I want to see him play. Ty Summers is still there. Oren Burks is still there. 
Not super high on either of those guys, but we'll see what they can do. It's probably both of their last opportunities, if I had to guess. And then, of course, Isaiah McDuffie. Really want to see the guy. Cornerback is going to be stupid exciting. You get a little bit of Kevin, a little bit of Jair, a little bit of Chandon. But um, Eric Stokes? Yeah, dude. You know how jacked I'm going to be to watch Eric Stokes? Get to see Josh Jackson. A lot of people thinking maybe he's going to take a step, myself included. Uh, Not that I expect him to be playing, but I, I still like Josh. I know there's talent in there, and and with the new defensive coordinator, maybe. We didn't get to see hardly any of Kadar Holman, so this is really the the best chance we get to see of him. And again, a lot of this has to do with not having a preseason last year, so we just haven't seen any of these guys at all. Shamar Jean Charles, super pumped to see him. Stanford Samuels is a guy that I thought had an outside shot, but obviously he just didn't really get an opportunity, didn't really get to play much last year. Same is true with Vernon Scott at safety. We get a little bit more of a chance to see him. So some of the positions, it's going to be a little bit more boring. But man, especially on offense, I mean, it just doesn't matter anywhere and everywhere. So I'm, uh, man, I'm excited about about preseason. This is this has got to be the most exciting preseason ever. I could be wrong. Maybe try to remind me of something, but I can't imagine, especially considering there wasn't one last year. Again, the quarterback stuff, the drama with with Rodgers and everything else, assuming he's there, I mean, it's just it just makes it all the more exciting. And volatile, because you're going to have, obviously, if, if Jordan Love plays and is very good, you're going to have insufferable people on there, you know, talking trash. If he's terrible, you're going to have really insufferable people on there talking trash. You know, whatever. It is what it is. But anyways, August 14th, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time. We are 94 days away from kickoff, from being able to actually watch this to be able to actually enjoy this. As far as the Texans, I mean, it's just, they're just a giant punching bag. Um, Their starters are not good, which means their backups are going to be even worse. And then you factor in, I mean, like, who did they draft? Did they do anything exciting? No, dude. They, I mean, they got Davis Mills at quarterback in the third round. That was their first pick because that's the earliest they could get one. And uh, the Vikings actually sniped Kellen Mond one pick before the Texans. So obviously we have to assume that's who the Texans want, just because we know the Texans are the most cursed team ever. Not because of Viking strategy or anything like that. By the way, Tampa, like three picks earlier, was Kyle Trask. So you had Trask, then Andre Sisco, then Kellen Mond, and then <laughs> then Davis Mills to the Texans. So we'll get a chance to see Davis Mills, and it'll hopefully be when our young corners uh, can go out there and get some interceptions. That would be fantastic. They also, I mean, they, they, were, they went heavy offense, so they got a wide receiver, Nico Collins. They got Brevin Jordan, the tight end, in the fifth round, which is pretty shocking that he went that far. Um, but, again, there's, there's, there's not, a lot, not a lot of real exciting showdowns there. However, probably the most stacked rookie class was the Jets, and we get the Jets in uh, week two of the preseason. So we're going to get an opportunity to see Zach Wilson. We're going to see offensive lineman of Elijah Vera Tucker. We're going to see wide receiver Elijah Moore. They got running back Michael Carter. Again, heavy offense, but they actually got some players. Um, second half of the draft was heavy defense, but that'll be kind of fun. I mean, it as far as just being able to kick back and enjoy some stuff and get the young guys some competition, it's going to be fun to see Zach Wilson and some of these guys up close and you know, I mean, Elijah Moore is a fun wide receiver. We'll see what he can do and see if our guys can uh, can do some do some damage. Bills went heavy defense, so if we're assuming, again, kind of rookies against rookies kind of thing, they got Gregory Rousseau and followed it up with Carlos Basham. So they got two of the uh, sort of, I guess you'd call them, second-tier pass rushers. So that'll be kind of a fun matchup as far as our young offensive linemen going up against the Bills' young defensive line. Again, not all that super exciting, but... I'm just excited about the preseason. I'm excited to see, uh, actually, to be honest, for the first time ever, probably bummed that there's only three weeks in the preseason. But anyways, then we get into the real meat of things. Um, and it's a pretty interesting beginning of the schedule. We have at New Orleans, which, again, I don't know exactly what the pack... That's part of what makes this so hard is I can't sit here and say, that's a win, that's a loss, that's a win, because I don't know if Rodgers is our quarterback. I'm going to assume he is, but I don't know. The crazy thing about the... The Saints, though, and, and a lot of people are concerned because kind of just get stuck on the fact that, you know, Saints are a good team. Their quarterback is gone. And as of right now, Taysom Hill is listed as their top quarterback. Now, that may very well change and become Jameis Winston, but last year on their depth chart, Taysom Hill was the number two quarterback. This year, our lads has Taysom Hill as the number one, probably just for that reason. But this may legitimately be just Taysom Hill. 
And so I don't want to disrespect the Saints. Obviously, they've got some good pieces. Still have a very solid offensive line, at least as far as their tackles are concerned. Obviously, have a talented wide receiver. Uh, Taysom is pretty electric, at least as far as his rushing ability. Alvin Kamara is talented. The defensive line is talented. But I do think if Rodgers is here, this is this is going to be just an absolute beating. That's that's my prediction. Obviously, I'm biased, but I, I just think it's going to be an absolute, just, just a beating. Um, Taysom Hill is going to be able to do some stuff, but um, I don't think he's going to be able to do stuff consistently enough to match up with the Packers' defense. And again, the the uh, the defense is there, but in patches. The defensive backs are not good enough. And so I just, look, I mean, we, we beat them last year, and they had Drew Brees, and they don't have Drew Brees. So, I mean, that just, that kind of sums it up for me. Next up, you got the Detroit Lions in week two. This is at home. Look, uh, I... They're, they're a team that's rebuilding. And again, I, I, I think if you're a Lions fan, you have every reason in the world to be optimistic. I think you got some good people in the building. I think you're building the correct way. I think you got some real good pieces in the draft. And, um, you know, you could potentially in the next year or two or three or whatever it is, be the best team in the NFC North. I don't know. It's possible. But it's not in 2021. And this is one where, look, if, if Jordan Love is the quarterback, week one is going to be interesting because it entirely hinges on how competent Jordan Love slash Blake Bortles is. Week two, I kind of don't care. Um, look, it's possible Jared Goff just lights it up, but but throws to who? And, you know, there's still some issues with the offense, and the defense is still just pathetic. Um, you know, so I, even if all the, the rookies hit, which obviously we know that's not going to happen, Lions just they just don't have a professional football team right now. They just don't. Now watch, every year I've been saying watch out for the Lions, they're going to be better than you think. The one year I trash them, they're going to be really good. But um no, I just I mean there's there's just there's nothing here for me. Again, the offense maybe it got Jared Goff, but what's he going to do? He had a much better offensive scheme and he had, you know, better wide receivers and everything. I mean, remember Jared Goff was good like really good for like one year when he had a really stacked offensive line and wide receivers and Sean McVay's offense was just kind of kicking off as people kind of adapted to Sean McVay not saying they've entirely done it but it's kind of the novelty wore off and things started to erode a little bit Jared Goff went backwards a little bit but remember how he started when he didn't have a really good offensive minded head coach and he didn't have a lot of really good pieces he was a laughing stock of the NFL so I'm not entirely sure how high the ceiling is but I know absolutely how low the floor is for Jared Goff so they better hope that Swift and uh, Hawkinson are just tearing it up right now. But even so, again, this 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 is maybe the worst group of DBs, depending on Okuda's growth. Um, but the safeties, the corners, just it's brutal, and the linebackers are just pathetic. And the defensive line, I I don't know, man. I mean, props to Flowers, but I, I got nothing. So look, if if Rogers is back, I think it's two and zero. I think the Saints might be able to put up a fight. They've got the talent, right? It's kind of similar to what we say about the Packers if they do lose Aaron Rodgers. It's like, look, they're not a trash football team. They have a good football team. That's the Saints. They've got a good football team. It's just hard to drag it along with a guy that's, you know, not necessarily the best quarterback. Got the 49ers. Everybody is really scared of the 49ers. I'm really not. Um, I mean, you got to remember, the, the 49ers have been a really bad football team pretty much every year except one year. This has been my my grudge against the 49ers and Shanahan in general. Shanahan is still seen as one of the greatest coaches um, that has ever been ever anywhere ever. His record so far is or has been six and ten, fourth in the division, four and twelve, third in the division, thirteen and three, obviously first in the division, went to the Super Bowl, and then six and ten, fourth in the division again. That's the 49ers. Well, there were issues with blah 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 blah. Okay, whatever. And I know they got a new quarterback, but we're talking week three. Are we saying Trey Lance is like, what, some kind of elite quarterback in week three? I mean, maybe. I mean, he's a mobile quarterback, which is always scary. They got a good offensive line, great tight ends, great wide receivers, great... I mean, the offense is horrifying. And the defense, I mean, they got Bosa. Cornerbacks are a little bit rough. Safeties are a little bit rough. Fred Warner had a real good year last year, a linebacker. But otherwise, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not saying it's a walk in the park, but I don't know why... I don't know. Again, if Rodgers is back, the Packers are favorites all three weeks, unless things just go completely south and they go 0-2, and then maybe the 49ers get the nod. You know, things can change. But I believe that they'll go into those games as the favorites. 
And yes, that's at San Francisco, which is going to be a massive problem because it's just obviously it has to be at San Francisco. But then we're home again, week four. And and so far, at least, it's a, a good mix of away, home, away, home, um, away, away, but it's also local, but then home again. And then so it's it's not like last year it was you, you get piles of away and piles of home. It's a good mix. It's a good blend. But uh, back home again, week four. This is going to be against the Pittsburgh Steelers. And and look, again, there, there are always components to a lot of these teams where you can look at it and say, I could see a situation where this gets out of hand and we lose this game. But this is another team that's kind of just a mess. I mean, it's it's not as bad as the Lions, but it's a mess. The offensive line has imploded. Um, that is to say, most of the guys have left. The ones that haven't aren't exactly what they were. Ben Roethlisberger has been getting worse basically every year. We saw the, the offense last year... Um, implode. I mean, they started off the season undefeated, and then the offense was the worst offense in football, just being drugged by the defense, although not well enough because, you know, they were losing. But uh, the weapons are not that great. People, Steelers fans, lose their mind because they think they have the best wide receiver group in all of football. Uh, Juju Smith-Schuster last year ranked 63rd. Um, you've got, uh, Deontay Johnson ranked 61st at uh, wide receiver. They did draft a running back and they got Pat Fryermuth. That's all good and well. They do have TJ Watt. They do have a decent, uh, defensive line, but they don't have elite corners. They don't have elite linebackers. The safeties are pretty good, but it, again, it's not an unbeatable thing. If the offensive line can hold up, there's not much else to this team. Watt, to it, Hayward. That's, that's 75% of the talent. And then you got Minka Fitzpatrick and, uh, you know, Terrell Edmonds is decent. But Joe Hayden is not anything special at all. So, again, I don't know why, again, assuming Rodgers is here and we can... I, I, it's not even worth talking about if Rodgers isn't here because I have no way of having any idea what's going to happen when Love comes in. If he's a very good quarterback, nothing changes. If he's a garbage quarterback, we lose most of these games. I don't, I don't know what else to say. It is also worth noting uh, when we look at these, the Packers get very few noon games. The Saints game is 325. Um, this is central time, obviously. Lions, 715. 49ers, 720. Uh, what Lions game is actually Monday. Steelers, 325. And then this Bengals game away at Cincinnati is actually one of the few uh, noon games. And again, I mean, we got to see what Joe Burrow can do. And they've, they've obviously went out and got... Uh, Jamar Chase at wide receiver. They got T. Higgins from last year. So they got a pile of wide receivers. Um, but that's about it, man. I mean, the offensive line is still not good, and they didn't. They chose not to really do anything to improve that outside of getting Jackson Carmen in the second round. Mixon, I, I keep praising Mixon, who is a serial um, abuser. He's not really serial. It was just one thing, but I'm going to call him that anyways because he's kind of a jerk. But he, he's never really broken out, and, you know, it is what it is. Linebackers are a joke. Um, the defensive line is is okay, but there's not a lot here. I mean, Trey Waynes is one of the best players on their defense. What does that tell you? It is worth noting Jesse Bates, the safety, who is in his second or third year, was the number one rated safety in football last year, which is it's quite a, quite a feat. But um, and again, what is the scenario in which we lose? It's Joe Burrow, Higgins, and Chase just take this thing over, and the Packers just can't quite get anything going. But I just don't see that happening. So yes, I do think this is a win. Packers in week six, again, a noon game at Chicago. Um, obviously, the biggest thing outside of who our quarterback is, is the Bears quarterback. Now, there's no way of knowing 100% that Justin Fields is the guy, but I think it's safe to assume Justin Fields is going to be the guy, as in playing possibly, probably week one. I, I think I think the Bears, I mean, look, they got saddled with Trubisky. They got stuck with Trubisky. They didn't handpick Trubisky. And so this is their opportunity to put their stamp on their guy, and this is their last chance. I mean, they got to go all in and win, so they don't have a lot of... They can't wait half the year for uh, to figure out what's going to happen. He's going to go out there, trial by fire, and he needs to start winning football games. But as I said, one of the biggest issues I have with the Bears is they're not setting themselves up to be able to build around their quarterback. They're giving away all their picks. So, yes, they got a new quarterback, and that's good for them. Yes, they went out and got a new tackle. Unfortunately, that tackle is replacing the old tackle that now just signed with Washington, and that also doesn't help replace the right tackle that left, and then the right guard who left the year before that. So we lost three. We drafted one in the second round to come in and be the left tackle, which, as a rookie, I can't necessarily assume he's going to be a super freak of a human being. He might be, but you can't necessarily assume that, meaning Justin Fields is probably going to be under a decent amount of duress. Outside of that, he has one 
wide receiver to throw to, and that's about it. This isn't Ohio State. He's not coming in as, you know, the favorite to win the football game with the best weapons everywhere. His offensive line is better than your defensive line. His wide receivers are better than your corners. Granted, that's the case for a lot of these guys. I'm not trying to pick on Justin Fields. I'm just saying this is a very different environment. Outside of that, we all fear the Bears' defense, but I don't know if that's necessarily warranted anymore. You have Khalil Mack, and as I'm looking at it, um, only two guys had 70 overall grades outside of Khalil Mack. You have Tashawn Gibson, the safety, and Bilal Nichols, and that's it. Akeem Hicks had a 75 or a 65 overall grade, 60th rated defensive lineman. Um, all the corners are gone. They brought in Desmond Trufant, who rated the was ranked the 120th out of 121 corners. Outside of a couple other guys, you got, uh, let's see, Jalen Johnson, who was a rookie second-round pick last year, was 84th out of 121. Uh, Duke Shelley didn't even play hardly very much at all. Danny Trevathan, 76 out of 83 linebackers. Roquan, 17th out of 83, which is not bad, but again, a 67 overall grade. And then the bell of the ball, Eddie Jackson, who had his one good year in 2018, uh, had a 59 overall grade, 63rd out of 94. So um, I don't expect good things from the Bears. That doesn't mean their quarterback isn't going to be a massive improvement, but the biggest issue the Bears have always had is the team has been eroding as they try to fix the quarterback thing. They may have officially just fixed the quarterback thing. The problem is I think this has fallen apart too much. So now they are at a point where they need to start building around the quarterback, and again, they gave away all their picks, so I don't know if that's going to happen, but the bottom line is the Packers are going to win this game. Week 7, Washington is going to come to Green Bay. I don't know that this is necessarily a walk in the park. Um, they do have, uh, Mr. Ryan Fitzpatrick at quarterback. And, um, again, the name Fitz magic, it just once in a while, he just gets a bug and just kind of goes after it. They got a good running back. They got a real good offensive line. They added Sam Cosme to the left tackle, which I mean, across the board from left tackle to right tackle, it's a pretty good group. They got a good group of wide receivers in McLaurin and Debo Samuel, sorry, Curtis Samuel, the other one. Um, real solid defensive line. You got the Alabama boys in the middle. You got Chase Young, who was one of the best pass rushers in football last year, as well as Montez Sweat, who had a breakout year last year. Corners are not that bad. William Jackson and Kendall Fuller. Outside of that, there's not a whole lot here, but I mean, we we pretty much went over the whole team. So, I mean, it's, it's not a Super Bowl caliber roster, but it's certainly a team that can come in and play spoiler, no problem. If you don't have your, your act together, they can wreck your offensive line. They can run right down your throat. They've got some great wide receivers and a veteran quarterback that can obviously distribute the ball. So, I mean, of of all the games, you know, the Saints worry me a little bit. 49ers worry me a little bit. But Washington is, they're kind of a, we don't really have those super elite guys, maybe Chase Young, right, or or Scherf at right guard. But they're just pretty good everywhere, right? They got decent, solid wide receivers, a decent, solid offensive line, solid quarterback, solid running back, solid defensive line, solid corners. I don't know. No, I think if the Packers are playing their best game, they're going to annihilate Washington. But you get, it, it's a game where if you're sleeping, you're going to lose. Then the Packers get at Arizona on Thursday. So this is kind of a problem where you're at home, you got a short week, and then you got to travel to Arizona, which kind of stinks. Now, as you know, I'm not a big Arizona fan. Are they scary? Of course. Kyler Murray is a talented guy. He's got another year to grow. They've got uh, Mr. Hopkins, who's arguably one of the best wide, or not arguably one of, He's you could say he's arguably the best, although you're not going to win that argument with Packer fans. Um, so, so again, they can do some stuff. They did bring in J.J. Watt, if he's even healthy at that point. But again, I, I, they're kind of the anti-Washington team where they're horrible everywhere, but they got some real solid pieces. J.J. was the seventh best edge rusher in football last year via PFF. Hopkins was the seventh best wide receiver. Murray was the 13th best quarterback. Humphreys was the fourth best left tackle. They added Rondale Moore to their offense. They got Robert Alford at corner in the second round. They got a good pair of safeties. But defensively, it's still kind of a mess. So again, it's one of those where if you're sleeping, it could be a problem. But I think the Packers have a real good opportunity, especially the offense versus their defense. I don't see how in the world they're going to stop the Packers' onslaught. I just don't really see it. There's just too many weapons, and this this defensive line is just too bad. Now, I mean, if, if Chandler Jones and J.J. Watt are both healthy and playing at their best, that's a decent duo, but you still got the rest of this defensive line that's not very good. So yes, I think the Packers should be the favorites in that game. That brings us to, obviously, the biggest challenge on the schedule, which is at Kansas City. Now, we got to see what happens by the time we get here, but I, I had said that if we could get past the Buccaneers in the NFC Championship game, I think we win the Super Bowl. Um, 
I've also mentioned that I think the Chiefs are going to start declining. They got rid of their GM, who was the guy that built this team. They haven't really done anything to build anything. It's basically still the same three guys, same four guys that run this whole team. You got Mahomes, you got Kelsey, you got Hill, and then Jones is the only real guy worth anything on the defense. Um, And now they're starting to lose players. They did go out and get Orlando Brown, bring him in as a left tackle. But remember, they got rid of their right and left tackle. So they probably downgraded their left tackle and lost their right tackle. Their wide receivers have completely eroded. They just have Hill, and the only other guys there are uh, Rayshon Pringle and Demarcus Robinson. Byron Pringle. I get all the wrong first names, but um, it's just the defense is terrible. Now, I know nobody ever wants to agree with me on it, but this is not a dominant defense. Now, it's still going to be a challenge, but I do think we're going to see the, the Kansas City Chiefs continue to regress. Um, talked a lot about that last year. And again, we got to see where the Packers are at. If they're if they're 500 right now, I'm not feeling super good about it. If they have one or two losses, I think the Packers win this game. And again, it's a big confidence boost because then you then you kind of look at it and say, see, if they would have just got past that one hurdle, if they even if you just want to look at it from a different standpoint and say, if another team had played Green Bay and Green Bay outside of Tampa, which for whatever reason is a team they couldn't beat, if anybody else walked in there, the Packers would have beat them. They would have played Kansas City in Florida for the Super Bowl. They would have won that game. Now, we don't know that for sure, but it's still nice to think about. And we have, speaking of teams that consistently erode, Seattle coming to Green Bay. Um, This was a one-sided thing in favor of Seattle for a while. It's becoming one-sided for the Green Bay Packers, where this isn't really much of a challenge anymore. Russ is still Russ. He's still a talented guy. They still got Lockett and Metcalf. Um, The offensive line is not as bad as it once was, but it's still a problem. Um, and the defense just continues to fall apart. I mean, they, they still have Rick Wagner, or but see what I'm doing here? Bobby Wagner, who somehow is able to keep it going at 31 years old, but obviously that's going to come to an end at some point. But outside of that, the corners aren't great. Defensive line isn't great. Safeties aren't great. Yes, that includes Jamal Adams, who has been the best safety in football. As I said, over the last two years, he was second in the NFL in 2018, fifth in 2019, 53rd in 2020. So do I think the Packers win against Seattle at home? Yes. Now we got Minnesota Vikings in Minnesota, which I think is really tough. Um, I think I've been saying the Vikings, I think, are going to be a good team. They, they've been tough to play the last few years anyways, and, and you know they're getting some guys back. That defensive line coming back is going to be massive. The biggest challenge they're going to have, number one, is the, the lack of depth and talent at corner. And um, number two is a lot of these guys just getting older, right? Can, can Kendrick's stay playing at a high level. He's had really good years the last two years. If he kind of regresses, you're in a lot of trouble, right? Um, you've, you're down to Harrison Smith. This is a team that had three, four dominant safeties at a time, and now you're down to Harrison Smith, and um, Harrison is 32 years old right now, so age is not on your side. The offensive line is still a work in progress. You did get Darisaw. We'll see what he can do. Obviously, Jefferson and Thielen and Cook and Cousins is is that sort of that group that you worry about. Um, I'm, I still think I give the nod to the Packers as far as who has the better team, but I would definitely be worried about the Vikings, especially in Minnesota. It's just, it's a tough game. Then we get to go to LA and play the Rams at 325 Central Standard Time and go see our old buddy Stafford, which I'll be honest, I think he's going to be in a great spot. First of all, he's going to California and, um, you know, I mean, he's not in Detroit, so he's got sunny weather. He's got the beaches. He gets a nice Cali house. Granted, it's not probably the greatest area in the world where the stadium is, but it's just a nice little upgrade. He's also going to get an upgraded offensive line. He's going to get an upgraded head coach, an offensive coordinator. He's going to get some upgraded wide receivers, although he doesn't really have a Kenny Galladay. He's got a good trio of guys. Probably an upgraded, uh, if not an upgraded running back, an upgraded running game. He's got the best defensive player in football on the other side of the field when he goes off the field. Good couple of corners, you know. I mean, it's, uh, it's a good situation. Am I a little bit worried? Yeah, I am. (laughs) <laughs> so so there you go we got the bears again in week 14 this is a sunday night game at 7 20 nothing really new there i should mention week 13 was our buy i forgot to mention that so we get a little bit of a rest and then we get chicago at home so that's that's a nice way to set up a just a, an absolute beating you know what i mean like we're gonna get rested up and our next game is at home and chicago has to come there and uh, it's just gonna be a, a nice way to just pummel pummel a, an opponent uh baltimore in baltimore noon game Baltimore's a good team. I mean, Jackson, again, another mobile quarterback. you got to worry about it. They love to run the ball. The offensive line isn't what it was. They lost their really, really talented uh, right tackle. They did add Villanueva from the Steelers, who is a you know 32-year-old guy. He's getting up there, but he's a talented football player. Um, 
you know, they got Hollywood Brown. They got the tight ends, like always. They went out and got Sammy Watkins from the Chiefs, which is nice that we don't have to see him against the Chiefs because it's a better chance. But now we got to see him against Baltimore. They got some good corners. They got a decent defensive line. I mean, they were worried about edge rushers and whatnot, but they did draft Jason Owe. Um, they got some good say. I mean, it's a good football team, kind of from, from head to toe. Um, you know, if Patrick Queen can stop being the worst linebacker in football, they might be able to hit every single position here. But uh, am I worried? Yes. Do I know who's going to win? No. I'll say the Packers just because, but uh, yeah, I'm worried about this one. Cleveland Browns, it's another team that's just stacked with talent. I mean, it's Baker Mayfield. The problem with the Browns is they're so volatile. All right, if you get the Browns at their best, you better watch out. If you get the Browns at their worst, they're they're a JV team, man. They're they're it's a college team. They're garbage. But real tough offensive line. It's going to be tough getting pressure on Baker. Um, obviously, got some really good wide receivers with Landry and Odell Beckham and Higgins and you know Hunt in the backfield. You got Clown, uh, excuse me, Miles Garrett, one of the better pass rushers in football, with Clowney on the other side. Um, they drafted Greg Newsom, so a lot of Packer fans who love Newsom are going to get the opportunity to see him, unfortunately, on the other side. They got Jeremiah owosu koromoa at linebacker. They got some really good... It's a good foot. It really is just a very, very good football team. This is one of the best rosters in football. They just do a terrible job of putting it together. If this team made it to the Super Bowl or at least the AFC Championship game, I wouldn't be super surprised. It's just a matter of consistency for them. But uh, anyways, then we end up with the Vikings in Week 17, and then finally January 9th playing the Detroit Lions in Detroit noon game. So all in all, we got, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, six noon games on the schedule, and that's it. Everything else is either an afternoon, a night game, whatever. But, um, you know, again, it's hard to do win-loss because I don't know exactly what our roster looks like, and we, we got to figure out, you know... W- w- it's, it's an impossible task because not only do you have to do it for the Packers, you got to do it for everybody else, right? What, what, what do we get out of our rookies? What are we getting out of our second and third year guys? I don't know, but I know that this is a very, very stacked and talented roster. I don't think there's anything that necessarily jumps out as, you know, um, something we need to be concerned about. You know, I mean, there's, like I said, it's, it's home and it's away and it's home and it's away. It's not like a huge batch of away games. The, the bye week isn't super terrible, although week 13 is pretty late. They're probably going to need that at that point. you got injuries maybe possibly stacking up, but um, it's pretty straightforward, man. And until there's any real negative news, it's all gravy. But anyways, i got to get going. You folks have yourselves a fantastic day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs>